Beautiful, thank you. All right, uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers for um, organizing, uh, which seems to be quite a feat uh, given the you know, amount of content that we're hearing in these uh, few days. Uh, and also uh, Carla for her kind of uh, leadership and vision, which has enabled several years ago us to start down this pathway of integrating materials and computer science. Uh, it started when uh, I was a PhD student here in Bruce Van Dover's group. He's going to be uh, speaking to us tomorrow. Um, and kind of to look at the end game, where, where the, the long-term vision here is to enable sustainable energy technologies. And I've depicted uh, one here uh, based on solar fuels generation, where we can use sunlight and CO2 and water from our atmosphere uh, to, to generate fuels that are usable we, you know, we, in, our, in today's infrastructure. Uh, and to create a really renewable, sustainable technology. Uh, this and other related technologies are really materials limited and we need to discover m new materials if we want to enable these uh, you know, in the real world. Um, and, and the materials discovery group in CompSestNet has kind of been working on uh, a group of these problems in, in, in developing new algorithms. So I've listed some of the current members there. Uh, there's some alumni and, and other members getting involved, and one of which is our next speaker, uh, Professor Rahman. Uh, and they've mostly been working on the X-ray diffraction problem, and you'll see some examples of this in Bruce's talk tomorrow and Ye Sheng's talk tomorrow. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, in, in way of introduction, is show you how we generate some of this materials discovery data, because this is quite a different topic uh, than the kind of uh, data types and data collection uh, strategies that we've seen in the talks uh, so far. So my group at uh, Caltech works in the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, and there's a, a picture of the group here. And uh, so what I'll be going through in these next slides is uh, our way of doing high throughput materials discovery, and which you'll see, I think, a lot of exciting data, uh, which is really begging for um, interaction with computer science to, to kind of advance both fields together. Uh, so quickly, the uh, Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis is JCAP. I'll refer to it as JCAP. It's a Department of Energy program uh, to enable solar fuels technology like uh, was depicted on the previous slide. So my team is one part of a, a much larger team uh, who's performing this research uh, in the state of California across multiple institutions and two dedicated laboratories. So my group works in the Jorgensen Laboratory uh, photograph there. So the, the overall strategy is to create a, a series of experiments that can be assembled into a pipeline to synthesize materials that have never been synthesized before and find out you know, what they're good for, and particularly for our use, find out if they're good at uh, performing these chemical reactions that are needed to synthesize fuels uh, using sunlight as an energy input. So we built uh, several pipelines, um, and I'm going to show you just some, some key experiments from these pipelines to, to get an idea of uh, what the data looks like. Right? So a, a important place to start, and this is kind of a universal topic for materials discovery, is, is thinking about composition spaces. So I, I didn't show a, peer, a picture of the periodic table. because you, you can envision that. But in creating new materials, what you want to do is, is you know, mix materials from the periodic table. And so if you choose three of those, you can represent all possible mixtures of them by a ternary composition triangle. So that's the triangle shown there with an A, B, and C. And uh, we can synthesize a lot of those compositions simultaneously using sputtering, and we'll sh see a video of that in the next slide. But a photograph of one such library, as I'll refer to them, is, is shown uh, right up here. And so this is vanadium, iron, and bismuth, uh, three elements from the periodic table. These are actually all oxides of those materials. And you see as you get uh, the continuous variation of composition across this 100 millimeter circle is what this photograph is, is up, you get a lot of different optical properties, right? So you can change these properties by changing the composition. And, and this is kind of the, um, the, the main strategy for exploring the materials. Uh, an interesting feature is that this is a two dimensional, two degrees of freedom composition space in a two dimensional flat plate. If you want to go to higher dimensional composition spaces, you need to get uh, a little more creative. So I've also shown a quaternary composition space with four elements, and we explore that kind of space by discretizing it and then printing out these uh, series of different compositions using an inkjet printer. And so these things uh, look pretty cool. And so to see you know, how cool they look, I'm going to show you this uh, sputtering chamber here. So inside of this vacuum chamber, we have these things that are essentially atomic spray guns. They're sputtered uh, d deposition uh, uh, tools. And so here's three elements being deposited simultaneously. So each of those little 
things you see is a different element from the periodic table being deposited. And then the inkjet printing that can print out the quaternary and higher order composition spaces by mixing different elemental precursors looks like that. And we then can also anneal these things, and, and Bruce will show you some, some fancier annealing tomorrow, I, I think. But we do have a, a series of different furnaces in which we can do different thermal processing to create really a very, very broad range of materials. Right. So these are the kind of tools that my group over the last five years has uh, built up at Caltech. And we can now make these materials and test them for, for various functionalities somewhere between 10 to you know, a million times faster than, than anyone else ever has been able to do. Right. So this creates an enormous amount of data. Any piece of data can be analyzed by human by hand and get the answer. But now we're doing this faster than, than you know, we can look at the data and becomes the, a, a more general, or it generalizes to uh, the problem we've seen uh, several times uh, today so far, which is uh, as you diversify the data and get uh, more of it, you need to teach computers how to do your data analysis for you. All right, just to give you a little flavor as to what some of these things uh, look like, uh, there's just a photograph uh, of one of the plates. So those are one millimeter squares. There, there's 18, 1,836 compositions on that plate. About 10 of them had ever been synthesized in a lab ever before. And so there's 1,800 and some you know, new ones. Uh, and you, these things are interesting. If you take these little images and reconstruct them into composition spaces, there's a, a series of, of the uh, triangles I, I mentioned. Uh, you see the kind of just the visual appearance of them changes systematically. And we can turn that into kind of a representative hue uh, and also quantify it more accurately or m more precisely uh, using uh, optical spectroscopy to get a band gap. And among other things, this band gap is a really critical uh, parameter for solar applications. It's, it determines the range of the solar spectrum that is absorbable by the material. Right? And so you get these uh, interesting trends in these composition spaces, and we'd like to understand those better. Um, another type of data is uh, comes by way of this uh, scanning droplet cell. So we have a lot of these robotic tools. This thing playing? Hard to tell. Well, I think the video isn't playing, but that's okay. I can still tell you what it does. Uh, we have a lot of kind of kind of semi-automated or robotic tools that will go and take uh, the do perform different experiments on these uh, composition libraries. So one of the plates uh, is photographed there with a little head that goes around and measures properties on each material. And from this kind of experiment, we get uh, data that, um, and, and there's a particularly noisy uh, uh, type of data I'm showing you here, uh, which, which is an interesting data set. And, and I wanted to show this data set for, um, for, for a couple reasons. One, just to give you kind of uh, idea of kind of the size of data. So what you're seeing here is a bunch of, of these composition triangles. And they're kind of laid out uh, vertically on the page. But then there's actually 15 layers of them for different sets of elements that we combined in different composition libraries. And then we measured their properties in a number of different pHs. These are, uh, you know, this is uh, aqueous electrochemistry is how the devices work. And so we took the water in which these reactions ran and then used different water at different pHs. And you see you get completely different composition trends depending on which pH you're in. So from a device point of view, if we want to you know, start a technology today and we want to build a device that works at a given pH, red means good in this color scale, and we choose any of the compositions that are red, and we can build a device, and that's great. But you know, what about using this to discover new materials and understand what's actually happening? Right? If you just choose the red materials and try to build devices with them, you, you ignored uh, the vast majority of the data here, which is all these trends we see as a function of pH, composition, temperature, a bunch of different things we vary. And uh, getting a comprehensive understanding of this is requires some uh, really computational framework, which is currently um, starting to emerge, but really at an infant uh, phase in the material science community. Okay. So another part, key part of understanding you know, what material is good for what reason and you know, getting the higher level of understanding of uh, behind those composition trends is understanding the phase of the material. So the phase, uh, it uh, can be referred to as a phase or a crystal structure. What I've uh, depicted here is four different crystal structures at the bottom. And these all contain the same elements. They all contain copper, vanadium, and oxygen from the periodic table. But when you combine the elements together in different ways, you get these different crystal structures, right? So here's four different crystal structures. And if we can 
these crystal structures, it turns out, have different properties. And, uh, but if we can determine the crystal structure, part of that is also determining, as part of that, we determine what kind of little structural motifs are in there. So that's what the kind of uh, dendrogram representation is showing, is how these overall crystal structures of the material are built up from these different motifs. And then these different motifs can exhibit uh, different key features in the functionality of the material, such as the, the photocurrent uh, or, or the catalytic activity that we saw in the previous slide. Right? So if we want to get a greater deal of understanding of uh, all these properties that we're measuring, we want to understand crystal structure. But doing high throughput determination of crystal structure is, is kind of an unsolved problem in material science and has been one of the key problems uh, that the, the ComCessNut group has been working on. So a traditional way of doing this is with X-ray diffraction, and, and that's the data that I'm going to kind of reserve uh, for the other talks, and you'll see examples. I wanted to show in this talk uh, a new experiment that we're doing uh, that creates a complementary type of data. So it's a Raman spectroscopy uh, experiment, and in Raman spectroscopy you shine a laser on the material, and that laser light interacts with the material and, and releases a spectrum which we detect, and that spectrum can be a fingerprint for a given crystal structure. Right, and so some different fingerprints are shown here, um, uh, kind of as examples. It's it's uh, you know a 1D data set where you get different peaks as a function of uh, the shift of the uh, laser light that you shined on it. So we we have a, a really brand new tool from uh, the Renishaw company where they did some uh, novel optics tr techniques to so that we can collect this data really fast, and you know think order of magnitude of 10,000 of these spectra per minute, right? Okay, so we have a lot of this data and we don't know what to do with it. And uh, I'm gonna show you a simple data set that we were able to analyze. And this data set represents a, a almost negligible fraction of the total amount of data we have yet to analyze uh, uh, using this kind of experiment. So what I photographed at the top there is a series of uh, 21 compositions uh, from this copper vanadium oxygen space uh, that I showed you some crystal structure from in the previous slide. And so those are one millimeter uh, little different compositions in the series of them going from uh, copper over there to vanadium over here. And we took 100,000 Raman spectra uh, on this region of the library that I showed here. And then uh, the Renishaw software has a, a proprietary algorithm that does uh, dynamic least squares uh, uh, kind of spectral demixing of this. And it happened to work fairly well for this data set and essentially to kind of extract the, the component fingerprints uh, related to the individual phases. And those are actually shown here. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six different phases detected here. And um, the red and green are kind of the, the demixed patterns. And the red is actually the pattern from literature from which to compare. So you can see these are fingerprints for these different phases. And those fingerprints happen to be already known in the literature so we could associate them with phase symbols. Okay. And this is important because just, I'm, I'm not going to tell you about the experiment, but the bottom left-hand corner is, is actually the, the current, kind of the, uh, the rate at which we're performing a solar fuels reaction. And, you know, the rate at which it happens varies non-monotonically with composition, but has certain uh, relationship to the underlying phase behavior. So the dotted lines, the vertical dotted lines are where we see different phases here, and when you when you cross the dotted line, you, you come to a new regime of this uh, kind of activity, and it's these kind of relationships that we want to understand, but understanding this crystal structure behavior is a prerequisite for doing that. Right? So as kind of, so here's like the nice situation up here that I just showed you, and on the left-hand side is some not nice situations. So if you collect, for example, like 100 million of these spectra over a broad composition space, you should be able to spectrally demix that and get the component patterns uh, just as well. Uh, but if you take the, uh, the only algorithm we have right now, which is the proprietary one in our software, and do that, you get some components at the top that look somewhat reasonable, and then on the bottom I'm showing you some completely unreasonable components that we know are just aphysical, right? And, but once you have aphysical components, you don't really believe the, the resolution of even the things that look kind of physical, and now we're left with a poor demixed problem and 100 million spectra, and what do we do next, right? So, uh, so the, this is a really kind of large data set problem uh, in material science. The X-ray diffraction one, which we'll see some examples of uh, tomorrow, is uh, a very similar problem uh, with smaller data sets that's a little bit more manageable for, for, uh, for really 
uh, stepping into this foray of uh, using state-of-the-art computer science and, and material science. Um, so I, I wanted to close with a couple kind of a, a summary of comments of why I think this is an interesting uh, field for computational sustainability to be involved in. Um, and, it's, and it's, I think, complementary to a lot of the problems we've seen in that it, uh, the, it is a hard science that we're here in the end. And I think, I, so I, I, the first bullet point, I think I already told you, there's a variety of problems to be solved. And the second bullet point is related to this being a hard science and there is a ground truth. So we do this high throughput data collection and we want a machine to, to uh, analyze that data. But for any given material space, we can use much more expensive methods to find the ground truth and that's a really important thing when you know we're trying to develop new algorithms and figuring out which one actually worked, right? Um, and and it's kind of a unique in, in, in its kind of ability to retake data, reproduce data, and, and find ground truths when that's important for advancing the project. Uh, third bullet point is there's a lot of physical constraints, and there's physical there's there's you know constraints in, in a lot of the other sustainability projects we've heard about, but there's some really you know fundamental physical constraints here which uh, not only pose challenges, but also some opportunities for how to tailor algorithms uh, to, to perform better than, than completely unguided algorithms or you know, like the dynamical least squares regression that we saw in, in the example that uh, does not use physical constraints and produces, as a result, a physical result. Uh, so another, another nice thing, and, and, and what I like being involved in these uh, kind of cross-disciplinary projects is that you know, my team built all those instruments and, and performs all those data. And if we find out from any of our interactions with the computer scientists that we need to be taking data at a different resolution with a different quality at a different rate, we can do that, right? So we can tailor uh, in, in a matter of, you know, day, days to weeks to months, depending on the extent, all of the experiments to, uh, to meet the needs uh, that the algorithms are telling us we need and creates a, a really, I think, unique opportunity for kind of productive feedback loops in, in that manner. Uh, and it's just as far as you know, getting back to kind of a keyword of sustainability, uh, this solar fuels is one important example, uh, but representative of a larger class of energy sustainability technologies uh, for which uh, we really need new materials. And this project um, is really helping us along on that front. So with that, I want to uh, thank, uh, first of all, the Department of Energy who sponsored you know, the development of all the equipment and all the high throughput data uh, uh, acquisition and then uh, and this CompSysNet uh, funding, which is really enabling us to really merge all this material science data with state-of-the-art computer science to advance both at the, simultaneously. So with that, I hope we have time for a couple questions. Thank you. So one one thing that I'm struck by the that that uh, proprietary algorithm behavior is, uh, I mean, what in an unmixing problem, once you screw up with one thing, you sort of screw up everything else too, right? So this is uh, we don't like that. Yeah, I don't <laughs> yeah, like I it mean, either. From an algorithmic yeah. standpoint, that's very scary. Yes. Um, is there anything? Uh, I get. I go. I guess there's not really anything you can do except. If you, if you could have some ground truth measurements at a couple of points, maybe that would constrain the rest of the problem? Is that what you're... That's one approach, and, and it's an approach we've had in the back of our mind, um, but we haven't executed that yet. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> okay. I guess we have... Well, it's related to a broader class of problems of you can also... Instead of using different experiments to get ground truth at a couple points, you could have a human analyze the data and tell you the human's interpretation of ground truth at a couple points, and that is exactly what we've been Which doing, we, yeah. and we'll see some uh, more on tomorrow. Okay. Well, thank you very much.